the home. Hi, Ariana. Hi, Alexander. How are things? Great, great. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining BPIA Chats today. I'm your host, Alexandra Maloney, and I hope everyone is staying safe and lifted during this time. So the purpose of this series is to share the experiences, insights, and information um, in regards to the international affairs community and hopefully to inspire the next generation to explore opportunities in this field. Also, the thoughts and views of our guest speakers are their own and do not reflect the views of BPIA. And we are currently streaming live and this talk will be posted on our IGTV and our YouTube channel afterwards. So if you haven't already, please follow Black Professionals in International Affairs, as well as our guest speaker and her organization whose handle can be found on her flyer um, on our page. And lastly, we encourage viewers to chime in below um, in the thread with any comments or questions that you all may have. So without further ado, I will introduce our guest speaker for today. Ms. Brianna Suarez is the International Admissions and Operations Manager at the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs, also known as APSIA. In her position, she guides prospective students to find the right graduate school programs for their careers, works internally with member schools, and works with outside partners and employers on hiring qualified candidates across multiple sectors of international affairs and public policy. She holds a Master's of Arts in Security Policy Studies from George Washington University, University's the Elliott School of International Affairs with a specialization in conflict, conflict resolution, and intelligence. So thank you so much, Brianna, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to chat with you today. So I'd like to start off by asking, could you share a little more about what APSIA is, what mm -hmm. Um, our, what's the mission of the organization and what are some of the resources that it provides? Definitely. So I work again for the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs, otherwise known as APSIA, because that title is very long. Um, and it is a consortium of the leading graduate schools that specialize in international affairs. So the way that I like to describe it is it's basically the umbrella in which all of the big graduate schools that do international affairs or public policy are part of. So our work is twofold. Um, we work on internally with the schools themselves to make them better schools for our students. So that's through conducting surveys, employment surveys to see where graduates land, um, doing a survey of the employment sector, of their own uh, internal offices, again, to be able to share best practices between all the schools so that when students go to the schools, you know, they become better graduates at the end of the day, better international affairs scholars. And then we work externally with students, prospective students from the moment they're thinking about graduate school, um, through applications, through the time that they're in APSIA schools. And then once they graduate, uh, we have resources like the jobs board where many organizations post openings. Um, and then we also work with employers themselves who are looking to hire graduates because we know our students are a testament of how good our schools are. Um, so they're usually looking for students that are APSIA students that fit that criteria again to being uh, agents of positive change within the interna international affairs sector. So we provide a lot of resources, all free to the public. Um, no one pays anything for anything that we do. Uh, I believe the only thing we charge for is the career networking reception that is solely for APSI students and graduates, and that is $10. Um, that probably won't be happening anytime soon with <laughs> COVID-19. But again, most of our resources are free, so we have our member directory, our affiliate directory, because we have a total of 68 schools currently part of the association. Um, we have a program matching tool on our website that does a little quiz and kind of narrows down some of the schools and programs you may be interested in. We have a fellowships and scholarships page so students can find funding for graduate school because that's a big topic we're always addressing. Um, the jobs board, which I previously mentioned, which lists a bunch of free jobs, not free jobs, excuse me, jobs and internships available to not just APSI students, but undergraduate students and those in the PhD tracks and mid-career professionals, um, and a lot more things that I could go into, certainly, but I'm sure that is not as exciting as talking a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi to those who have joined in. We're here with Brianna Suarez, who is the International Admissions and Operation Manager with the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs, also known as APSIA. 
Um, so if you have any, thank you for being here. And if you have any comments or questions, then please feel free to put them in the uh, comment box below. So my next question is around the topic of applying to graduate school. So yeah. maybe you could give us um, just a little perspective on maybe what the timeline looks like or the different stages um, of applying to a graduate school, specifically in international affairs. Certainly. So just as background, I do a best practices webinar every month for students. So this is going to be a very shrunken down version of that. Um, but I'm certainly happy to provide a timeline. So, and I speak of this as experience as someone who didn't do all the things I'm about to tell you to do. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely take this advice because I'm, I'm learning from it. Um, so when you're thinking about graduate school, you should, even before your application, there are certain things you need to ask yourself, um, such as what you want to learn. So what are the things you want to master? Why do you want to go to graduate school? and specifically the programs that you're applying to, ultimately what your professional career goal is, because that's what schools are gonna wanna hear in your essays and really learn about why you're considering graduate school. Um, thinking about where you're going to be located when you go to graduate school. So for me, I'm a city girl, I wanted to be in a city, so that's why I chose to go to graduate school here in DC. Um, and the financials. So that may be the first step you think about. Can you afford graduate school out of pocket at this moment? And if you can't, then you need to hit the ground running looking for fellowships and scholarships because a lot of the times students end up thinking about financial aid at the end of the application season. So once they've been admitted and a lot of the times most of those financial scholarships have already been allocated. So that's probably the first thing you wanna do. So by the time that you're then thinking about applying, it's about, at, at the very least, a 12 month process. So about a year out from application deadlines. So for those of you that may be thinking about 2021 admissions, um, which deadlines come up around, I mean, they can come up anywhere starting as of now through January, February, 2021, then you probably should be thinking and starting your applications at this moment, because it's gonna be a very long process. You're most likely going to be applying to more than one school and there's no common app like there is in the undergraduate stage. So there's not one central application that you just send out to multiple schools. You're going to be applying to different schools at the same time. So you want to be sure you're tracking all of your deadlines. You're tracking all of the financial situations. And if you're applying for financial aid, all of the forms you're going to be requiring. And then through the 12 month process, you're going to be, you know, doing your research, figuring out what schools you're interested in. Um, and I would really, really urge students to look past the name. A lot of students get caught up on the big names because they think that because of rankings, because of prestige, when really it should be about your own career path and what this degree is going to do for you. Because at the, at the end of the day, you're going to be investing in yourself and you're most likely going to be paying some money out of pocket. So it would be really unfortunate if you just ended up at a school because of the name and you realize that that degree isn't going to do anything for what you actually want to do. So when you're doing the research, look at what you're actually going to be learning and the thing you're interested in rather than the name. Yes, those school names are great. Yes, they have prestige. But at the end of the day, at the uh, interview, that school isn't going to be interviewing. You are. So they're looking at the merits you bring to the table and what you did with that degree. Past the research stage, you should be reaching out to admissions counselors at those schools that you're very interested in attending and asking personal questions not just because you make that connection and you get more of the in-depth look at the process, but you also might be making the connection with someone who will be allocating financial aid. Sometimes they're part of the admissions committee that is allocating money, and you may be up against someone that has the very similar background to you, but because you've made that personal connection, you might be getting an extra bit of cash that you wouldn't have previously. So past that, around the three to six month mark, here's where you should be now putting together all of your application materials, asking for recommendations from your recommenders, which I'm more than happy to elaborate a little bit more on, writing your essays and personal statements and triple checking, quadruple checking that they're accurate and really emphasize why you're passionate about going into this field or transitioning into this field or whatnot, putting it all together because there are going to be multiple components, again, tracking all your deadlines. And then by the time you apply, you really want to make sure that you've handed everything in, 
that everything has been received, that you followed instructions to the T, because that's one of the ways to get, you know, uh, not discredited, but ignored in the process because you weren't, didn't manage to follow the basic instruction of handing in, let's say, three recommendation letters versus two. Um, and then you also want to make sure that you're recommending your recommenders, I mean, excuse me, thanking your recommenders because they took time out of their day to help you. Um, and you really never know when you'll need another recommendation letter at the end of the day. They're part of your network. So you want to consistently be, you know, having them in your sphere. And lastly, after applications, we really recommend you continue to learn about programs because programs are constantly changing. As we see now, many programs are now starting to enact a hybrid in-person module uh, given COVID-19. So you want to consistently be on top of what new things that school may be providing because that will really help you make a decision at what school you want to land on. So I, that was a super, super truncated version of my <laughs> webinar. Um, but that's kind of the, the general timeline. Thank you so much. Very well explained. <laughs> very <laughs> thank well you. Explained, so thank you. Um, because as someone who did, I did my MPA at Cornell University and I get the question so much of how do I go to an Ivy League school? How do I get so much focus on the yeah. school rather than what do mm -hmm. you bring to this program and what do you, you know, how does this fit into the blueprint of your career path? Um, so thank you. We will be sharing information more on your webinars at BPIA for, <laughs> uh, for our members. Um, hi, thank you everyone for joining in. I see we have a few folks who've joined. We're here with Brianna Suarez, who is an international um, admissions and operations manager with the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs, APSIA. That's a little bit of a mouthful. <laughs> it is always a mouthful, and I always have to take a, a swig of water at the end, and just be like, oof, okay, let's get this going now. Uh, so feel free to drop any questions or comments that you have um, for Brianna here, as she is an expert in this space. So please use this time um, to get any questions that you have answered. So my next question is in reference to something you mentioned in your last statement about these recommendations from uh, institutions. So what are some of the things that um, these APSIA member institutions are looking for in terms of successful applicants or someone who seems to be maybe a fit for these different programs? What are some um, of the skills and experiences from the past that folks yeah, can hone in on? Definitely. So there is no one of the big questions and I'm going to turn it on turn this into a question that I kind of always get and it's kind of what is the perfect formula into getting into graduate school right what is what does the school want to see and what can I convey and there is no one there is no formula because they're usually looking for different experiences and perspectives from different students but usually the four top things that they're going to be looking through your application is an aptitude for study and a chance of success in the program. So that's the reason that they ask for your transcripts and to see your grades and how you've done in the GRE and the TOEFL. Again, to see how you've done in an academic setting in the past, because at the end of the day, you're going to a school. So they want to see how you've done in academic settings previously. Not to say that if you have a lower GPA or, you know, a lower GRE score than what they average, you know, accept that you won't be accepted. But again, it's for them to get an idea of how you've done traditionally in school. The third thing that they're looking for, and I say this, um, and I, they are looking to build a holistic class. They're looking at applications holistically. So it's very easy for students to get, you know, very focused on their own application, which granted you will, you are one person applying, but they're looking at to build a class with multiple experiences and perspectives of students um, that come from different backgrounds. So that's why a lot of the times they're talking about diversity and not just in the US context of race. They're looking for diverse experiences, um, older students and younger students. So they want to see that you're bringing something to the table that someone, let's say, who's done a traditional IA degree may not necessarily know. So that's why when students are saying, is it a disadvantage if I'm, I studied engineering, but now I'm into this field, is that gonna be a disadvantage? Not at all. That's probably an advantage for you because you're bringing something new to the table and you can discuss a certain topic in a different light that wouldn't be traditionally discussed um, in that classroom. So focusing in on things that you've done in the past that may bring a different perspective to the table is always great. 
And then lastly, they want to see a clear sense of professional direction. Um, and I always come back to this. Uh, students get hung up on the fact that they think they need to know what they're going to do after graduation when that's not always the case, right? Not all of us have a clear path in what we want to do exactly at after graduation at 5 p.m. I'm going to be working at the UN, at OCHA, working on the ground. No, but it's just understanding what you want to do, what you want to achieve. And they want to see again, what are you going to be doing with this degree? Right. After you graduate, where do you see yourself headed? Um, and one good tip for students and anyone that's thinking about graduate school or just even changing career paths is looking at those that you admire and seeing how they got to those paths, seeing what their path was, where they ended up working, looking at the alumni of the school and the degree specifically and seeing what those alumni are actually doing with the degree. So you can get an understanding of like, okay, if I'm getting an MPA, maybe I want to work in the nonprofit sector with a certain organization doing health, but in an MPA setting. Right. Um, so thinking through, again, your professional direction is going to be incredibly important. And it's probably going to be one of the things they really hone in on during application season. Great. Thank you for sharing. Um, thank you for sharing all those perspectives and, and very valuable information. I wish I would have had this um, as I was applying because similar to you, you know, I um, took kind of a nonlinear, nontraditional route. Um, and learned what I could, when I could, how I could, you know. Exactly. Um, so my next question to you is a little more about, I, I'm, we're interested in hearing a little more about um, your experience. So at GW, um, and what sort of classes you took and um, what was what was your overall experience there like, as well as what sparked your interest in the international affairs space? Definitely. So I actually, I guess I would be the traditional student for IA these days because I did my undergraduate in international affairs uh, with a concentration in French. So I'm, I like to say bilingual and a half because I speak some French, I'm losing it, but I speak Spanish, English, and some French. Um, so I've been really interested in this field since I would say middle school. Middle school is probably when I first remember, you know, learning about world history specifically World War II and the Holocaust. And I kind of just had that question of why. Why did this happen? Why, why did it happen? So through high school, through college, I explored those interests. And I ended up working at Doctors Without Borders after I graduated. Mm -hmm. And that was the time, I don't know if many students or people remember this time, but it was 2015 when some of the hospitals were bombed in Kunduz, Afghanistan by the US government. Okay. So I was, you know, working at the New York headquarters at that time. And I kind of just, you know, I, I had this understanding of international affairs, or at least what it should look like, mm -hmm. but the current events weren't matching up. So that was kind of the point where I decided I need to go back to grad school because clearly I'm missing something, you know, I, I needed to make that reconciliation. And so I decided to go back to graduate school to learn a little bit more about just what is going on currently, where we are, um, and not just in international affairs context, but in a conflict resolution context, because yeah. uh, that was what I had been working in, what I was interested in, and in a war and in terrorism and intelligence sector as well. Um, and that just kind of, that's how I landed into grad school at Elliott. Um, I thought Elliot was going to be the right choice for me. I had been researching it for actually years, probably since my junior year. Um, so I was kind of up to up to hip hip on all of the prerequisites, knew what I needed to provide. I love a city. Um, I'm a New York native, New York City, born and raised, Manhattan, stay strong. Um, yes. And just wanted to be in a city. I knew that. a powerhouse, just like New York City in the international affairs uh, sector, but specifically for national security, which I was also interested in. Um, I got funding and there are just more options, more things that went into the decision, but that's kind of how I ended up here um, in DC and how I've ended up in my specific title. Um, well, I graduated and then I took up the diversity fellowship with AFSIA and I was offered the full-time position once my fellowship was up. So that's very briefly a history on Brianna. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. 
So this is my uh, final question and feel free to put any concluding thoughts um, onto this, but it's simple. What advice would you give to someone who is considering um, an international affairs graduate school program? Definitely. So I think I, there are multiple things I would recommend and I could definitely get into the funding and the recommendation parts, but I'm going to talk from a personal perspective, just as a, someone in the field. I think one of the big things is confidence, being confident in yourself and in your skills. Um, I've suffered through imposter syndrome. I know many scholars and many people in the field that still suffer it even years after being successful. And I think just being confident that you belong in the room. You shouldn't shy away from the skills, even if they're not the traditional skills that you see um, that they're listing on a website, right? So if you're coming from a different background, you know, lean into that. That is an asset to you, that you're bringing a different perspective. Be confident in that because there's value to having a different voice in the room other than that silo of everyone agreeing with each other. That would be pretty boring if everyone was saying, yes, 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 yes. So confidence is key. Um, ignore that, try to battle the imposter syndrome. It's super difficult, but again, that's where confidence comes in. Learning to advocate for yourself early on is extremely important because if you can't speak up for your own skills and yourself, it's gonna be hard for somebody else to. And then lastly, not to fret if things aren't going the way you thought they were going to be going. Um, I know personally, I thought that getting into the undergraduate uh, institution I went to was like the worst thing to happen because it wasn't my top choice. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't have gotten me to where I am today in a happy, happy position doing things that I actually love to do. Um, so understand that your life is not going to be linear, most likely you're going to be jumping, zigzagging through your career, and that's okay. It's only when you look back and connect the dots that the clearer picture comes into, into light. So be, it'll be okay, I promise. <laughs> um, and then I see someone just asked a question. I'm going to ask if you could just address it quickly, but it says, would you recommend learning another language in grad school? Definitely. So they're most likely going to be looking for, especially in the international affairs uh, sector, they're most likely going to be looking for some sort of skill set, either quantitative skills, so that you're good in statistics or have taken statistics courses previously, that you know another language. It doesn't have to be a formal language the way that we speak, but coding is a language that they may be looking for. So I would definitely suggest that you do. It's great to have a second language in your back pocket because that makes you uh, more marketable. You can work in different settings that isn't just the, your native language. Um, so you will most likely be an asset to whichever employee, employer, excuse me, that you will be hired for. So try to practice that even if it's, you know, beginner intermediate, that's okay. That's, you're usually gonna have help in an employer setting um, from somebody else, so it's okay. Great, thank you, Brianna. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for coming to speak to us today and share all of this insight on graduate schools and international affairs. Um, thank you to everyone who joined in for this call today. So if you'd like to learn more about APSIA, um, Brianna, maybe you could share where folks can come to find more information on that. Definitely. So feel free to go to our website, which is APSIA.org. Uh, again, all of our resources are on that page. All of our events are on that page. So feel free to look through that. We have our online fair graduate school fair coming up in July. Um, so that if you are interested in connecting with graduate schools free, um, you can do so virtually there. Um, and if you have any questions for me personally, I'm always happy to answer questions. Um, so email me at Brianna, B-R-I-A-N-A -A at APSIA, A-P-S-I-A dot org. Um, happy to connect with anyone and just provide those tools that I didn't have when I was applying to graduate school. Brianna, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who joined in today. Um, so again, please follow Black Professionals in International Affairs for more relevant, you know, content and resources around um, opportunities in international affairs, as well as follow APSIA at APSIA uh, Info on their Instagram. Um, and we look forward to seeing folks at future BPI chats. I'll definitely be tuning in. So thank you for having me today. Thank you all. Thank you. And, and be safe out there. Be safe. Wash your hands. Yes. <laughs> Alrighty. Have a great day. Have a great day.